I'd now like to spend a couple of minutes giving an example of how we can use experiments to discover how to personalize. The context was a team at HarvardX that wanted to send emails out to learners in a MOOC to find out why they dropped out of the course. So they wanted to enhance response rates to these emails. So I worked with them to design an experiment. And my goal was to use the experiment to estimate what the benefits would be of enhancing or personalizing directly. Here's the email people would receive, ask them about their course participation, and try to get them to fill out a survey about why they had dropped out. And so I consider the original message as being brief, just directly getting to the point. But I added another condition where we mentioned that they've been active. It's been a while since you logged into the course, so we eager to learn about your experience. And so I analyzed this data for all 3,600 people, but I actually split these into two groups. So I want to do analysis on one group and then use that data to estimate what if we'd actually chosen the best condition to everyone in the second group. For example, enhancing by choosing the best or personalizing. So this gives some estimate of what the effect would be if we actually were to do this dynamically. So choosing the better message didn't actually have much of an effect. It's slightly increased response rate. In this case, the better message was just the original one. But this masks the fact that the two conditions had very different effects. When you broke this data up by how many days people are active, the first message, the brief one, was very effective people who weren't active much at all. Maybe because they were more likely to read it and then go on to answer the survey. Whereas you got higher response rates to people who were more active when you mentioned they've been active, possibly because they wanted to justify their recent inactivity. And so if we personalized giving the brief message to low activity and the mentioning inactivity message to high activity learners, then actually there was a significant benefit on that second batch, a 7% increase in response rates. Now I think this is a very simple example and a lot of my future work is going to be exploring ways to use experiments to discover how to personalize. For example, we're planning work now where we send emails dynamically, inviting learners to return to a course and even linking them to web apps that will help them plan. But we can now discover how to personalize these emails or personalize components of these planning apps to help people return and engage in courses. I think this is exciting because it shows how we can begin to personalize design in an empirical way. And it also offers a way to optimize technology, not by just adding new conditions to find out what's the best approach, but actually just using the alternatives we already have, but leveraging data to deliver these in a more sophisticated way. I don't want to turn to my future directions because this approach of collaborative, dynamic, personalized experimentation is going to reach its real potential, I think, as we expand it to other domains. So the kind of topics I hope to advise dissertations on are building systems for experimentation they are going to bridge designs as with social behavioral scientists and machine learning researchers. And also applying this from education to other resources like technology to enhance mental and physical health by helping people learn to change habits and behavior. All the experiments I've been presented have been focused on optimizing outcomes for users like students. But I want to build systems experimentation with other end users in mind, making it easier for designers to conduct studies and dynamically put the data into practice. Allowing social behavioral scientists to come out of the lab and conduct research on real-world learning, real-world behavior. And finally, allowing machine learning and statistics researchers to apply algorithms that will actually do real-time exploration exploitation in actual environments. I've applied to a NSF cyber infrastructure grant to develop the software and ecosystem we need 
to start to bring these different groups together. When most software engineers implement A-B experiments, they naturally just make it possible to assign alternates equally. But this poses huge technical barriers to being later on able to do the kind of dynamic, personalized collaborative experimentation that I've mentioned. The architectures behind edX and Khan Academy would require massive re-engineering. And so I developed the Adopcom specification, which provides software engineers with guidance so that they can implement software that allows simple A-B experiments, but leave the gate open so that later on, if someone wants to start dynamically adapting conditions or personalizing, they've got the data structures and APIs to do this. We've implemented this as a Python Django web app, which anyone can use to declare simple A-B experiments, but again, be able to plug in different algorithms to dynamically adapt, or have API calls that can allow people to add conditions dynamically. This provides a backend for starting to explore how we can help designers and behavioral scientists conduct studies together. I built an app that three instructors at Harvard have used to do experiments in their online courses. For example, testing out different motivational tips. Current tools in, in system ecosystems like Canvas make it hard to collaborate with someone outside, like a scientist, because the instructor essentially has to sign over all permissions to see student data and to change anything in the course. But using the Adopcom framework, I've actually designed a use as a backend for a system where a social behavioral scientist can easily just access the relevant experiment. They can propose conditions and look at aggregated outcome measures in a way that I'm, I'm hoping will allow instructors and designers designers and scientists to work together more fruitfully. This kind of approach could also be applied to startups and product improvement more generally. And I'd be happy to talk about how I've discussed this approach with experimentation teams at groups like Facebook and Microsoft. One key issue I anticipate is that designers are going to want to put the best conditions to practice as quickly as possible. But social behavioral scientists have methods for gathering data that usually relies on uniform random assignment. This is where I think dynamic analysis has a lot of promise. We might be able to manage this tension between impacting practical design and conducting science. I presented some of this work at a statistics conference, the Atlantic Causal Inference Conference. And there are many methods that can be used to help social scientists do valid analysis of their data. But it's important to be able to bring these into the context where these studies are being done and socialize these methods. I think this is where researchers in statistics and machine learning can be extremely valuable. What's the incentive for a statistics researcher or a machine learning researcher to be involved in helping analyze data from experiments? Well, I see these tools as test beds. Ex implementing experiments using the Adopcom specification provides an abstraction for reinforcement learning. All a machine learning researcher has to know is it's an Adopcom, and they're guaranteed that they've got the APIs so that they can actually add new conditions, access data anonymously, and actually use an algorithm that will propose a policy and then guide experimentation. The same way that internet scale data has helped drive forward methods like deep learning, I'm hoping that providing these kinds of tools can help reinforce the learning researchers go in new directions, where they've got to handle real world issues around processing speed and using the kind of noisy data that's available in applications. To bring these different constituents together, I think I'm interested in exploring how we can build interpretable and interactive interfaces to machine learning. For example, how do we go beyond a black box algorithm? Do designers find it more interpretable to understand a policy in terms of weighted randomization? Are these methods that can help social scientists know how to analyze their data? 
I think these systems will be more effective if they allow humans in the loop to interact with algorithms, such as letting your designer influence the expiration exploitation trade-off. Another advantage is to encoding designers or scientists prior knowledge, such as via Bayesian models. I hope you're sharing my excitement about how we can take something as simple as a randomized experiment and use it as a bridge between railroad product design, social behavioral science, and machine learning and statistics. This approach to experimentation can also go far beyond education. I mentioned that I had done work previously on helping people learn cognitive behavioral therapy to tackle issues like depression. More recently, I've been looking at how we can enhance mental health through online training for peer counselors. And I think this kind of dynamic, collaborative, personalized experimentation approach is going to be especially important in helping people learn to tackle mental health issues. The work I've done before was funded by co-writing a grant supplement for NIH. And more generally, NIH is recognizing they have a new science and behavior change initiative where they're really interested in how we can bring together scientists from psychology and computer science to actually build technology that's going to impact real world behavior. Methods like cognitive behavioral therapy have been shown to be effective not just in depression, but also in tackling issues like smoking. So I'm especially excited about taking apps and experimenting, for example, testing out different prompts to have people explain or reflect on their cravings, or testing which motivational reminders work for different people. And users could actually submit requests for the kind of prompt they'd like that's going to help motivate them, which can not only personalize it to an individual user, but also provide conditions that we could then test out on other people. So I'm hoping that this kind of approach can help us tackle biological problems like health by providing technology that uses psychological and competition solutions. In conclusion, I outlined at the beginning this vision for perpetually improving systems that can help people learn or change behavior. And my approach behind all this is dynamic, personalized, collaborative experimentation. I presented two examples of experiments that bridge psychological theory with instructional design in motivating learners on Khan Academy to adopt a growth mindset of intelligence and in designing prompts to reflect that help people construct their own knowledge. I presented the adaptive exclamation improvement system, which relied on crowdsourcing explanations from learners to, to add experimental conditions continuously, and then use multi arm bandits to dynamically analyze data in real time, discovering which explanations people found helpful, and then deploying them to future learners. And this produced explanations that help learning as much as an actual instructor's explanation. I gave just one simple illustration of how we can use experiments to discover how to personalize, which I hope is just the first step towards more personalized design. But I'm especially excited about the future, how we can use this dynamic, personalized, collaborative experimentation approach to bridge design, social behavioral science, and machine learning, and have an impact in context from formal education to apps that will enhance mental and physical health to product design and startups more generally. Thank you.